spiritual disciplines are the gifts of God's grace that He uses to make us holy like He is holy. Christian counselor and author Jay Adams reminds us of our need for perseverance and discipline when he writes, You may have tried to obtain instant godliness. There is no such thing. Today we have instant pudding, instant coffee, instant everything. We want instant godliness as well. We want somebody to give us three easy steps to godliness, and we'll take them next Friday and be godly. The trouble is, godliness doesn't come that way. The Bible is very plain about how godliness does come. Paul wrote about godliness to Timothy. In his first letter to that budding young minister, he said, Timothy, you must discipline yourself for the purpose of godliness. Discipline is the secret of godliness. Adams continues, the word discipline has disappeared from our minds, our mouths, our pulpits, and our culture. We hardly know what discipline means in modern American society. And yet there is no other way to attain godliness. Discipline is a path to godliness. Well, how can I discipline myself, you ask? Well, first you must recognize that the very word discipline makes it clear that godliness cannot be zapped. It cannot be whipped up like instant pudding. Discipline means work. It means sustained daily effort. The word Paul uses is the one from which the English words gymnastics and gymnasium have been derived. It is clearly a term related to athletics. An athlete becomes an expert only by years of hard practice. There are no instant athletes. Last Sunday, Luke introduced us to the critical role the spiritual disciplines play in our sanctification. Last week we were reminded that apart from the practice of God-given disciplines, we will not grow in godliness. Apart from our willingness to engage God through activities like studying, fasting, praying, we cannot grow and become like Christ. After reminding us of the necessity of spiritual disciplines in general, Luke went on to briefly introduce us to several disciplines, including service, fasting, praying, and engaging the Bible, which is the Word of God. It is that last discipline, the discipline of engaging Scripture, that we're going to focus on this morning. Regarding the disciplines of God's Word, J. Adams again writes, The Holy Spirit has plainly told us how He works. He says in the Scriptures that He works through the Scriptures. He continues, There is no easier path to godliness, there is no easier path to godliness than the prayerful study and obedient practice of God's Word. Well, this morning, I wonder if we really believe that. Do we really understand how essential God's Word is to both our existence and our salvation? Do we remember that the Word of God is in fact the power of God? Genesis chapter 1 declares that. By the power of His Word, God spoke the universe into being. Genesis 1 says, And God said, Let there be light. And there was light. And God said, let the earth sprout vegetation. And it was so. And God said, Let the earth bring forth living creatures according to their kinds. And it was so. In the beginning, God demonstrates the power of His Word when He spoke this universe into being. 
In Isaiah 55, verses 10 and 11, God reminds us that His Word still retains His power today. In Isaiah 55, verses 10 and 11, God declares, For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return there, but water the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty but it shall accomplish that which I purpose and succeed in the thing for which I sent it. See, from beginning to end, the Word of God is the power of God. When God speaks, His will is accomplished. When God's Word is read, when it's proclaimed, it does produce the fruit that He desires it to produce. And that is why we who call ourselves by the name of Christ must take care to devote ourselves to God's Word. We must devote ourselves to God's Word because God's Word is His power to save. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 23. 1 Peter 1, 23 reminds us that we have been born again, those who are believers... We have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable through the living and abiding Word of God. We've been born again through the Word of God. Likewise, Romans 10 verse 17 declares, faith comes from hearing and hearing through the Word of Christ. And so we need to remember as believers, our salvation was birthed in our lives through the Word of God. But God's powerful Word doesn't stop working in our lives after our initial salvation. Not only only is God's Word powerful to save us, once we are saved, God's Word is powerful to sanctify us. It's powerful to make us holy. When Jesus prays for us in John chapter 17, verse 17, He says, Father, sanctify them. Sanctify my followers. Sanctify my disciples in the truth or by the truth. And Jesus prays, Your word is truth. Do we hear what Jesus says? God's Word is the instrument God uses to make us holy, to make us godly. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 tells us how. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, Paul writes, All Scripture is breathed out by God and is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God, the woman of God, may be competent and equipped for every good work. See, don't miss the means God uses to equip you and me as Christians for good works. Don't miss the instrument God uses to make us holy and to change us. God uses the Bible. It's His Word that rebukes us when we need rebuking. It's His Word that corrects us when we need correcting. It's His Word that teaches us and oh how we need to be taught. And it's His Word that trains us to live in a way that pleases Him. I wonder if we really do comprehend the power of God's Word. Do we really comprehend the power of His Word to save us? And once we're saved, do we really believe in the power of God's Word to transform us, to sanctify us? Because God's Word 
It has that power to change your life, to change my life. And that's why Jesus promises what he promises in John chapter 8, verses 31 and 32, where Jesus says, If you, if you disciples, if you abide in my word, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples and you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. It'll set you free. Can I ask this morning, do you believe that God's word has the power to set you free, really set you free from all your sinful habits and thoughts? Do you really believe that God's word has the power to set you free from your addictions? Do you really believe that God's word has the power to transform your life? Do you believe it enough? Do I believe it enough to constantly abide in his word? Do we believe the power of God's word enough to treasure scripture more than we treasure our comfort? To treasure Scripture more than we treasure our money. To treasure the Bible more than we treasure TV, novels, social media, and all kinds of other meaningless consumers of our energy and of our time. If only we could see everything that God offers us in His Word. If only we would understand the power of this book that we hold in our hands. If only we would give ourselves to Scripture and immerse ourselves in Scripture, then you know what we do? We will rejoice with the psalmist when he sings, the law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey and the drippings of the honeycomb. Do we get that excited about Scripture? Today it would be good for us to stop and for each of us to ask ourselves how sweet the Word of God really is to us. Have you personally tasted the power of God's Word? Do you value God's Word as your treasure? Do you devote yourself to knowing God's Word, obeying God's Word, sharing God's Word with others? Are we really letting the truth of God's Word, really letting it set us free? In order to answer those questions... We have to stop and state the obvious. Before we can taste the power of God's Word, before we can treasure God's Word, before we can know God's Word and obey God's Word and share God's Word, before we can be set free from God's Word, we have to make time in our lives to engage God's Word. We have to make time to engage the Word of God. And making time to engage God's Word is going to be inconvenient for us. It will cause us to make choices we don't want to always make. Making room for God's Word will require us to go to inconvenient places we may not want to go. It will require us to exert energy and effort that at times we simply won't want to exert. That's why they call spiritual disciplines disciplines. So what are the spiritual disciplines that God gives us that enable us to engage Him in His Word, to be transformed by His Word? Well, the first discipline is the discipline of simply hearing God's Word. 
the discipline of hearing God's Word. I think it would be impossible to overemphasize the importance of regularly hearing the Word of God. We've already heard Romans 10.17 declare that faith comes by hearing and hearing through the Word of Christ. And again, we've said that not only is hearing God's Word essential to our initial salvation, but it is essential to our growth once we've been saved. And that is why in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 13, Paul instructs a young pastor to devote himself in his ministry to the public reading of Scripture so that people can hear. Devote yourself, Timothy, to the public reading of Scripture, to exhortation, and to teaching. In the same way, he instructs Timothy to preach the Word and to be ready in season and out of season. So how regularly do you give yourself to the discipline of hearing the Word of God? You know, the age we live in is incredible when it comes to hearing God's Word. We have access to God's Word on CDs. You just pop it in the whatever CD player, that's what it's called, in your car. And I know that I'm still living at the end of the 20th century. I know that we've moved beyond CDs. That's just where I'm at, okay? We've also... <laughs> he's B.A. still with cassette tape, so... But you know what? We, <laughs> we also have access to preaching on the radio, podcast. I'm getting there. But most important of all, we have the opportunity every Sunday to come together as a church family and to hear God's truth proclaimed. Do you look forward to that? Amen. Do you plan for that? Or is Sunday worship just something that's optional in your mind? And how do you prepare for the worship service, for the hearing of God's Word? Do you take the time to prepare your heart for that before you come? Do you pray and ask God to impress His truth on your heart each week? Do you really take time to prepare yourself to hear His voice? Or is church just a social gathering in your heart and in your mind? See, the discipline of hearing God's Word is essential to your Christian life. But in so many ways, it's really only just the start. Because not only does growing in godliness require us to hear God's Word, it also requires us to read God's Word. Unfortunately, many professing Christians really don't spend that much time reading the Bible. Many of us just claim that we don't have the time. But is that really true? You know how long it takes to read the entire Bible out loud? Audio versions of the Bible demonstrate that it takes about 71 hours to read through the entire Bible out loud. 71 hours. Do you know how long it takes the average American to watch 71 hours of TV? Less than two weeks. Less than two weeks. See, here's the truth. Reading through the Bible in a year would require most of us to only read 15 to 20 minutes a day. So let's just be honest with ourselves. If we're not regularly reading the Bible, it's not because we don't have time. It's because we're lazy. Or worse... It's because the Bible just isn't that important to us when push comes to shove. Growing in godliness then requires us to engage in God's Word. And engaging the Bible requires us to exercise the discipline of hearing His Word and the discipline of reading God's Word. And third, the discipline of studying God's Word, to study God's Word. 
If we want to grow in Christ, it's not enough for us just to read the Bible. At some point, we actually have to begin to study it in depth. In his book, The Pursuit of Holiness, Jerry Bridges reminds us, reading the Bible gives the breath of Scripture to us. But studying the Bible gives us depth. Reading the Bible gives us breath. Studying the Bible gives us depth. We need to understand that the Bible will not yield the fullness of all its treasures to those who only skim the surface and nothing more. The Bible's transforming power is most fully experienced by those who are willing to dig deep. If you have your Bible, turn with me to Proverbs. The book of Proverbs, chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. Proverbs 2, verses 1 through 5. In Proverbs chapter 2, the wisdom of God cries out to us. And listen to the invitation that God's wisdom extends to you and me regarding Scripture. Proverbs 2, beginning with verse 1. My son, my daughter, if you receive my words and treasure up my commandments with you, making your ear attentive to wisdom, inclining your heart to understanding. Yes, if you call out for insight and raise your voice for understanding, and if you seek it like silver, if you seek it like silver, if you search for it as for hidden treasures, then you will understand the fear of the Lord And then you will find the knowledge of God. Do we hear what wisdom says to us? The knowledge of God is for those who long for it. The knowledge of God is for those who seek for it and search for it like a prospector seeks and searches for silver or for gold. See, if we're serious about God... We need to regularly hear God's Word, read God's Word. And on top of that, we need to dig. We need to study God's Word. If you're not involved in some kind of a serious Bible study, I want to encourage you to get involved. In addition to our Sunday morning Bible hour, 9.45, even here at the church we have a women's Bible study that meets every Monday. There's a morning session and there's an evening session. Why not pick the one that works best for you and get involved? Right now they're studying in the book of Romans. In addition, we are starting a new men's Bible study. And it's going to meet every Saturday, starting next Saturday, at 7 o'clock to 8.30 every Saturday morning. 7 o'clock to 8.30 Every Saturday morning, we're beginning a Bible study, the men of the church together, on the nature of God. It's called Behold Your God. And this is a perfect time to jump right in, because you get to jump in right at the start. If you need a copy of the first week's lesson, see Tony. Tony, stick your hand up. See Tony, and he'll get you a copy of the first lesson today, so you can start in tomorrow and be ready for Saturday morning. Whatever you do, commit yourself to more than simply reading the Bible. Commit yourself to studying the Bible, to digging deep into God's Word. You know, our God is a God of grace. And in His grace, He gives us spiritual disciplines so we can grow. So we can know God better. So we can learn to obey Him more. God gives us the disciplines of hearing His Word reading His Word, and studying His Word. But even that's not all. God gives us the discipline of meditating on His Word. Meditating on His Word. Turn to the first chapter of Psalms. Psalm 1. Psalm 1, the first three verses. And listen to what David says. Listen to the promise here. 
Psalm 1, verses 1 through 3. David writes, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law, on God's word, he meditates, he meditates day and night. He's like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. In all he does, he prospers. In the same way, Psalm 63, verses 5 and 6, David says, My soul will be satisfied as with fat and rich food, and my mouth will praise you with joyful lips when I remember you upon my bed and meditate on you in the watches of the night. Psalm 119, verse 17. The psalmist cries out, Make me understand the ways of your precepts, and I will meditate, Lord, I will meditate on your wondrous works. Psalm 119, verse 99, the psalmist again says, I have more understanding than all my teachers. You want to show up your teachers? He says, I have understanding more than all my teachers, for your testimonies are my meditation. Again, verse 148, Psalm 119, My eyes are awake before the watches of the night that I might meditate on your promise. So what's it mean to meditate on God, to meditate on His Word? Well, let's not make it more complicated than it is. To meditate simply means to think about, to contemplate, to mull over a truth that you have discovered in Scripture. We meditate when we think about what would it mean to love somebody else like God has loved me in Christ. That's meditating. What would it mean for me to do that? We meditate when we think about what the Bible means when it tells us that God is holy. And how does the holiness of God, how should that impact my life? That's meditation. We meditate when we've lost a job or suffered a divorce or can't pay our bills and we begin to think about how Romans 8.28 applies to our circumstances when it promises us that those who love God, for those who love God, all things work together for good. We begin to meditate and think about how does this promise apply to my life and my circumstances. In other words, meditation is the way... God gets His truth from our heads into our hearts. Meditation is what God has given us to move His truth, to move His Word from our heads to our hearts. Meditation is thinking about how we can apply God's truth to our daily lives. So what do you think about during the day? Is your mind filled with the truths of God's Word? Are you meditating on His truth as you go through your daily life? How often do we choose to let God's truth occupy our minds? It's a choice we make throughout our days. Choosing to let God's truth occupy our minds. Of course, if you're going to meditate on God's Word, guess what that means? At some point, you've got to memorize it. <laughs> Memorizing God's Word is a fifth discipline that God offers us for the sake of our spiritual growth. And notice how all these go together. You can't meditate on what you don't read. You can't meditate and think about what's not in your head already through memorizing, through studying. But in Psalm 119.11, 
The psalmist talks about memorizing the word of God when he says, I have stored up your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Don't memorize just to memorize. Memorize for the sake of allowing that word to change your heart and to change your life. Psalm 37, 30 and 31, David writes, The mouth of the righteous utters wisdom. His tongue speaks justice. And the law of God is in his heart. The law of God is in his heart. You know what? People who get really serious about holiness, they begin to memorize God's word. I already know what you're thinking. I'm no good at memorizing. Let's not kid ourselves. I'll bet we all memorize stuff all the time in our daily lives. You know your phone number? Okay, some of you don't because you've got that stupid little (laughs) cell phone. But you should know your phone number. But let's, let's make this simple. And I'm talking to myself here, by the way. If all of us just memorized one verse a week, one verse a week, how many verses would you have in your heart at the end of a year? Quick math, 52. In two years, if you memorize just one verse a week, you would have 104 verses of Scripture stored in your heart. In 10 years, if you memorize just one verse a week, you'd have 520 verses stored in your heart. Now let me ask you, do you think 10 years from now, having 520 Bible verses stored in your heart, you think that might make a difference in your life? Just one verse a week. It would make more of a difference in your life and in my life and in fact the life of this church than we can even imagine. And so we all need to understand when we think about spiritual disciplines, spiritual disciplines aren't some kind of burden God dumps on us. Spiritual disciplines are God's gifts to us. They're an expression of His grace. And when it comes to the disciplines, perhaps the greatest gift of His grace of all is the gift of His Word. Because Jesus promises us, if we abide in the Word, if we abide in His Word, we will know the truth, and the truth will set us free. Don't you want to be free? Do we understand it's there for the taking? It's there for the taking. Just all we have to do is discipline ourselves. Hear God's Word. Read God's Word. Study God's Word. Meditate on God's Word. Memorize God's Word. And we will know the freedom that Jesus offers us as we abide in the gift of the written Word of God.